Welcome to the machine learning um, seminar. Um, it's the first after a longer break. Um, and I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce to you William, Professor William Stafford Noble. He's joining us online from Seattle in Washington, right? Um, and um, I invited uh, William because of his strong background in applied machine learning. Um, application fields are more related to molecular biology, as you might have seen from the, the abstract already. Um, however, William received a PhD in, compute, in computer science and cognitive science um, from the University of California, where he also did a short P, P, uh, postdoc. And um, then he became assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. And now for more than 20 years, he's um, at the University of Washington in the computer science department. Uh, he has also adjunct um, appointments at the Paul Allen School of Computer Science besides others um, in Seattle. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the talk because it's uh, strongly related to, to, to my PhD work in computational biology. That was the time in which I read a lot of um, papers from from William and, and his research lab. And what I also found interesting that it's, um, there are also studies about um, important concepts also for, for the, let's say machine learning field, not directly applied to, to biology. I, I'm just thinking about a very recent preprint about, um, um, about interaction um, measures from features that help to, to understand deep neural networks, which is quite re uh, relevant for, for explainable artificial intelligence, right? So I think there's a lot of interesting work and I'm looking forward to, to a talk that um, is about a lot about proteomics, right? But then also single cell data. So William, I'm happy to hand over to you. All right. And move forward. Thank you. So yeah, this is a talk that um, I've got a couple different vignettes here, two of them from uh, mass spectrometry proteomics and one from single cell genomics. Um, I understand we wanna have some time for discussion after, so I'm aiming for like 40 minutes. And so I've, I don't give as much detail on all the different validation experiments we've done in each story. So I sort of cut some of that out so that it was only a 40 minute talk, uh, but I'm happy to have more discussion after. Um, <clears throat> I find that in general, uh, people tend not to be so familiar with mass spectrometry proteomics. So I'll start by just explaining sort of what the data is uh, before we talk about what the machine learning problems are. Um, so basically, the mass spectrometry is kind of like high throughput sequencing. Um, in genomics, high throughput sequencing is a platform technology that enables lots of different kinds of experiments, and mass spectrometry does that for proteomics. And so as you probably know, proteins are large, complicated molecules. These are just pictures of some 3D structures of proteins, but they're difficult to deal with in a high throughput fashion because they all have different chemical properties. And so in mass spectrometry, the, the experiment begins by digesting each protein into pieces called peptides. And then it's those peptides that get analyzed by a mass spectrometer. Uh, the, the, they go in through a liquid chromatography uh, column and they get fragmented and so on. And it produces at a rate of about 10 to 20 um, spectra per second, these data objects that are called um, mass spectra. So each one of these spectra ideally corresponds to a population of uh, one, uh, many copies of the same peptide sequence. And so the main computational task, or the first one anyway, is to say what was the peptide responsible for generating this sequence? And so you have some computer that says, okay, that first spectrum was, was generated by GDIF, YP, et cetera. The second one by LPL, EN, EN, and so on. So that's kind of the problem at hand. If we look more closely at the data objects, the spectra themselves, they look like this. The horizontal axis is the mass to charge ratio where charge is usually one or two or three. Um, and then the y-axis is intensity, which you can think of as like a, a analogous to a count of how many fragments with that particular mass to charge ratio did we see. 
And ideally, each peak in this spectrum corresponds to one fragmentation event. So for example, if we take this, this peptide and cleave it into the blue bit and the green bit, the blue bit gives rise to the peak that's at 88.14, and the red, the, the green bit, the, the suffix, is the peak at 1304. And for uh, in, in the math spec field, the, the prefix ions are known as B ions, and the suffixes are known as Y ions. <clears throat> so there are actually multiple different ways that these things can fragment. So you can get B and Y, but you can also get a C and a Z and an A and an X. So there's multiple different kinds of ions, ion types that can show up for each fragmentation event. And you can also have things like molecular groups that fall off the side that lead to things called neutral losses. And the, that is mostly just to say that in practice, the full spectrum is pretty complicated. So this is an observed spectrum where we've labeled the blue peaks are the ones that correspond to those B or Y ions. The lighter blue ones are the ones that we can say, oh, this corresponds to one of these, what's called a neutral loss. But then all the gray stuff is other unknown stuff, right? And that's what makes the problem hard is that some of that's noise, some of that is other peptides that got in there that shouldn't have been in there or other non-peptide things. Um, and so that's what one of the things that makes the problem challenging. So the first problem I want to tell you about um, was started by Damon May when he was a PhD student in my lab and then finished by Wout Vitrimia, who was a postdoc in the lab um, and is now a professor in Belgium. And it was a collaboration with Jeff Bilms in the electrical engineering department. And the motivation for the project was to try to make better use of public data repositories. So Proteomics was kind of late to the party in terms of open data access, but it's gotten much better over the last decade or so, um, in the sense that when you submit data to most of the big journals in the field, if, if you submit a paper to a journal and it reports new mass spectrometry data, they will require that you make that data publicly available by depositing it somewhere like in the Massive Repository or the Pride Repository or Pep Peptide Atlas. The problem we were trying to address was that the typical workflow is something like this. You do a bunch of ge data generation, you analyze it all, you write your paper, and then you're like, oh, darn it. Before we submit, we have to, we have to deposit this data somewhere. Otherwise, we're not allowed to submit. And so you send it off into the repository, you forget about it, and then you go back and publish your next paper, right? And what we would like to see instead is you generate your data and you immediately deposit your data because you hope that when you analyze the data, you'll actually be able to make use of the fact that, it's, that it lives in this repository and has a context of all the other experiments that have been done before it. So the hypothesis is that we can obtain more accurate and useful information about a, a collection of spectra that we generated. Um, and we hope to use the, do that using a supervised deep learning method that exploits pe peptide spectrum assignments during training. So I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean by that. So <clears throat> the main concept here is that we're gonna to try to learn a, a high dimensional embedding or actually a relatively low dimensional embedding, a 32 dimensional embedding in practice um, where we are taking a complex data type, the mass spectra that I just described to you that are typically analyzed with like specialized algorithms and require a lot of memory. And we're gonna, project those into a, a lower dimensional space that can basically be operated on by out of the box algorithms um, efficiently. And so in order to do this, the idea is, let's say that we had successfully embedded, say this set of spectra into a two dimensional space, and maybe not all of them are even identified, but if they are, if, they're, if we get a new spectrum, we go ahead and embed it here and then we just look around at its neighborhood and we say, oh, well, look, its neighbors have this sequence. So therefore, that's probably what the sequence of the spectrum that we just embedded. So that's kind of the concept. Um, the main thing we have to do is figure out how to train a neural network to do this. And um, the first challenge we faced is how do we represent this complicated data object for input to the mass spectrometer? Um, this is what we did in this project, which is the earlier of the two projects. We segregated our knowledge about the spectrum into three categories. There's sort of parameters of the experiment, like the accuracy of the instrument, um, 
There's information about the intact peptide that's measured in what's called a precursor scan of the mass spectrometry. And then there's the actual fragment information, which we represented in two different ways, both in terms of the uh, uh, discretizing the MZ axis of that spectrum, and also by computing a bunch of similarities to, to a, a reference set of spectra. Um, but the point is you can take all three of those sets of features um, and put them through a neural network to, cr to create an embedding. So this is the, the neural network architecture that we ended up with. You have the fragment features, which correspond to that binned MZ axis. Uh, where each value in this vector is the intensity of the peak at that particular MZ location. You have these precursor features that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and then you have these reference spectrum features, which are basically um, uh, cosine similarities to a, a fixed set of reference spectra. Um, and what happens is that you go through convolutional neural networks, followed by max pooling, and then several dense layers, and the main output is a 32 dimensional representation of that spectrum. And the idea is that if this is a good representation, that should encode all the relevant information about the spectrum. So the question of course, is what makes it relevant? And what the, the key is to train this kind of embedder. And we do that in a sort of twin or a Siamese architecture where you actually, that whole previous slide is represented by this little purple box here. So this is that embedding architecture. It creates a 32 dimensional representation of S spectrum S1. And here's another copy of the same embedder that makes a, 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 a version of S2. And then you have some loss function here, which is based on the similarity of those two spectra, okay? And the key is that we have labels on the spectra. So we've used a database search procedure to pre-annotate a big collection. Actually, we didn't do it. We downloaded a set of spectra that had been pre-annotated in a systematic effort by a group that runs the massive repository. Um, and we only took identifications that were highly confident. So, you know, they had like a less than 1% false discovery rate associated with them. And so then for this pair, we can label them one or zero, depending on whether the two spectra were generated by the same peptide, in which case we want them to be close together, or by different peptides, in which case we want them to be far apart. And so this loss function on the right here actually ends up looking like this. This is the actual loss function here. And this is a schematic to try to represent the idea that if two peptides are similar, we're gonna push them, we're gonna keep them within this red dotted line. And if they're dissimilar, we wanna push them apart. In terms of the function itself, you have the label here, Y, which I just described to you. And then you have the embedded spectrum for S1 and for S2, and some, a pre-specified margin here. And the key is that depending on whether Y is one or zero, either the first term or the second term gets turned on, right? In the first term, if it's, if it's a one, then they're the same peptide and you just want them to be as close as possible. Whereas if they're a different peptide, then you want them to be far apart, but as soon as it's outside of this margin, you say, okay, that's far enough. I don't care how far it is. And we can then train a huge system. We trained it on 30 million spectra, which in, corresponds to uh, 11 billion pairs of, of, um, of examples. Um, and the, the system itself has a um, recursive acronym. GLEAMS is a learned and better for annotating mass spectra. So that's the GLEAMS system. Um, here's some details on the training set. As I mentioned before, 31 terabytes of, of public data in massive. And from that, we got uh, 30 million PSMs that actually had a 0.1% false discovery rate. Um, and we trained on you know, the po positive and negative pairs from within them. So that's how the system gets set up and trained. Now, the question that you're probably wondering is, okay, I've got all my spectra. I can make a UMAP or a TSNE or something, and I can see that maybe they separate by charge state or something, but who cares, right? Why is this useful? So one thing that we did was just demonstrate that you can take an off-the-shelf clustering algorithm. We used one called DDSCAN that Martin Esther developed back in 1996. 
which is a widely used algorithm. This is just a figure from the Wikipedia page. Um, it's based on a sort of nearest neighbor approach. And I'm not going to describe the algorithm in detail because it's a standard out of the box clustering method. But the point is, um, there is actually a, a literature on how to cluster mass spectra. And there are existing methods like MARA cluster and MS cluster and spectra cluster that were specifically designed just for the task of clustering spectra. And we instead just took gleams and used the DB scan algorithm. And we measure things like what proportion of the spectra are clustered versus the, pr the proportion that are incorrectly clustered. And what you can see is, especially at low error rates, which is arguably what we care about the most, um, Gleams is actually doing better than its competitors. And there's several other ways you can evaluate performance. One of the most important ones is something called completeness, which in clustering terminology essentially says, how much, how how successfully did you manage to get all the examples that have the same label into the same cluster? So you can see in these two examples, every both of these, all of these clusters are correct, but the one on the left is less complete than the one on the right. And because Gleams is trained in a supervised way to try to force peptides, maybe from different algorithms, to to still be close together. Sorry, I said algorithms, different experiments to still be close together in the embedded space, it actually is much better at making more complete clusterings. So here's how Gleams compares to these other state-of-the-art methods um, in, in the clustering metric. And another way to think of that same thing is we looked at how many, if you just annotate each spectrum according to what study it came from when it was deposited into the repository, and then count how many spectra, um, how many different studies are in each cluster Gleams does a much better job of grabbing spectra from different places because it used a supervised algorithm for the, for the training of the embeddings. Um, so that's one example. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the other main example that we gave. I'll just tell you that the other thing that we do with Gleams is use it to explore what's called the dark proteome, which is in the mass spectrometry world, we talk about the dark proteome as those spectra that keep showing up and nobody ever knows what they are. So you can see the same spectrum gets, a, or a very similar pairs of spectra are observed across many, many experiments. And in none of those experiments have we ever assigned an identity to it. And what Gleams allows us to do with this, we do a clustering on 668 million spectra. And then we find large clusters that contain no identifications. And then with that small subset of interesting things, we can then do more expensive computational analysis to, to identify those. And we show a, a big boost in performance there as well. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over the details of that um, so that we can move on to the next story. But just as a summary, this is a way to learn an embedding that projects all of this data into a low dimensional space. And we can use that for things like clustering and targeted searching of, of, uh, un, of um, un, unidentified spectrum. So it's a good segue though, be, to the next algorithm or the next project, which is a sort of a natural outgrowth. Um, it's also a mass spectrometry analysis problem. Um, Wode is still involved here, uh, but then the first authors are Melly, who's a current a PhD student in my lab, and Will, who's a former postdoc in the lab, um, as well as a collaborator in the computer science department, Su Wung Oh, uh, and several undergraduates as well. Um, and in this problem, in, in this project, we attached, uh, attacked a slightly different problem. We're just going directly for the problem of, we've got the, the one I mentioned in the beginning. Somebody hands you a spectrum, and they want to know what's the amino acid sequence of the peptide that generated that spectrum. So I'll tell you that by far, 98% of the people who do this in practice use something called database search, which means you take your observed spectrum here um, on the left and you compare it to a theoretical spectrum that's generated from some protein sequence database. And you do that for all of the theoretical spectra and you find the one that matches the, with the best according to some score function that you've designed. And you say, okay, that's my, my hypothesis about what was the peptide that generated this spectrum. The alternative is to do what's called de novo database, uh, de novo uh, identification, where you don't have a database. So 
the first one works great for something like analyzing the human proteome. But if you want to look at, say, spectra generated from a sample of seawater, for example, or even if you want to look in the human proteome, but for, for proteins that are unexpected or different kinds of forms of those proteins that you didn't expect to be there, you have to do the de novo setting and just go directly from the spectrum to the to the uh, peptide. <clears throat> so um, database search in general is super powerful, but only, as I said, if you're working in some kind of organism where you know what the complete proteome is, and even then, they won't find things like genetic variation, post-translational modifications, and so on. There's also some applications, like I mentioned, metaproteomics, studying ocean water or dirt or the microbiome in your gut, um, and also some applications in things like immunopeptidomics and antibody sequencing. So this is the problem. Again, you have an observed mass spectrum on the left, um, and you also know the mass and the charge of the intact peptide. And then you have to predict what is the generating peptide. And the reason this is difficult is that we don't really know when we observe a spectrum, what is the identity of any given peak? Some of those peaks are correspond to prefixes, some are suffixes, some are neutral losses, some are other kinds of noise peaks and so on. And without that information, we can't really tell what the sequence was. In general, what you're looking for is pairs of peaks that are separated by amino acid masses. And that gives you some evidence that, you know, if there's this separation here, then a lysine might be present, for example. So obviously, we're not the first ones to work on this. People have been trying to do de novo sequencing at least since the mid-90s. Um, the original methods were done with sort of heuristic search procedures, and then in the early 2000s, a spate of dynamic programming algorithms. Um, later, you would not be surprised to hear that people tried to use machine learning and most recently deep learning. So historically, you can see just some examples here. Machine learning got introduced to this task around 2015, um, and deep learning came in around 2017. And so state-of-the-art methods really are um, all deep learning methods these days. But it's not a solved problem. You still only assign about 40 to 60% of the spectra of their correct peptide. And we observed that a lot of the methods that are out there use pretty complicated models um, with a lot of parameters, slow inference, and, and pretty um, arcane architectures. Um, and in particular, a lot of them relied on this discretization of the MZ axis, which leads to an unwieldy, uh, very long and sparse input vector. Um, so this is just a table comparing some of the methods in terms of their, their features. <clears throat> so we decided to try to frame this as a sort of sequence to sequence translation task and then use a transformer, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, super popular uh, kind of model architecture first developed in natural language processing settings. But the basic idea of a transformer architecture is that you're taking um, input tokens and learning embedded representations of them. But then there's a, there's a key step in the middle of the transformer, which is known as the attention mechanism that allows it to essentially uh, link up pairs of observations that may be separated in time along the chain. So the idea is in the transformer architecture in our setting, the attention mechanism might allow the model, for example, to say, oh, a B ion here might be linked to its corresponding Y ion because the sum of their masses is equal to the known mass of the peptide that generated it. Or this ion here is linked to this other ion because the difference in their masses is exactly equal to the mass of one of the amino acids. Those kind of dependencies can be picked up by the, the attention mechanism in the um, transformer architecture. So we input the MS2 spectrum here into the peak encoder. This gives you an embedded representation of the spectrum. And then that goes into the decoder, which takes as input just the precursor and the the beginning of the sequence, and it has to predict the next letter, essentially, in the sequence. So during training, we use obviously labeled training data. And so even if this, if the, we use do something called teacher forcing, where even if the model makes an incorrect prediction, in the next step, we actually give it the correct prefix and still ask it to, to predict the next letter. Um, and that's part of the, the training mechanism for these models. <clears throat> 
The actual loss function is quite straightforward. We're, we're inputting, or sorry, we're, we can output, uh, um, we, the peptide itself is represented as a one-hot encoding. So every amino acid is, is a 20-dimensional vector uh, with one, one bit uh, set to one. Um, and then the output predicted sequence is those same 20 amino acids. Actually, there's three post-translational modifications as well. So it's really 23 letters. Um, and you just do a sort of a mean squared error loss, right, between the, um, the predictions from the model and the desired prediction um, that you want. We used a standard nine species benchmark to train and evaluate this model. So this is actually developed by the Deep Novo paper. Um, and so what they did was they gathered data generated from nine different species and then they would train on eight species and test on one and do that nine different ways. So you get a cross validation by species. Um, you have about a total of 1.5 million mass spectra uh, with 300,000 distinct peptide sequences. Um, and the standard things to do in this field is to, to plot um, peptide level coverage and precision. So coverage is just the total number of predicted the predictions that you've made over the number of spectra. So just saying, as we go down our ranked list from the most confident to the least confident, are we 50% of the way along the list or 85% or what have you? And then precision is what you're all familiar with, which is essentially the accuracy of the, of the predictions that you've made so far. So here's a plot that shows how well Casanova is working. It's the blue line compared to both Deep Novo and Novor. Um, these are two state-of-the-art methods also on the, on the Deep Novo benchmark. Uh, the, the black star there corresponds to the position at which um, the predictions have been um, sorted so that if the difference between the, the, the predicted peptides mass and the mass of, that was observed along with the spectrum is too large, then we basically subtract one from the score. So most scores are between zero and one, and that star represents where zero is, and everything below it is negative because we believe all of those are incorrect because they're outside of the mass accuracy of the instrument. Um, and so that's this, this curve here just represents a bunch of incorrect stuff. But the point is, in the region that matters, which is the high part of this curve, uh, we're doing much better than either of the other methods. One of the things that we found in the um, preprint that was pretty surprising was that big data helps a lot. So the other thing we did was rather than train from Deep Novo, or sorry, from the yeah the Deep Novo benchmark, we used the same data set we used in Gleams, which is 30 million spectra instead of 1.5 million. And that gives you the light blue line. So if you read the preprint, that's on bioarchive, you'll see where we say, oh, look, increasing the size of our data set from 1.5 million to 30 million gives you this huge boost from average precision from 0.84 to 0.95. What I, I have to tell you today, though, is as of this week, one of the reviewers asked us to make a learning curve, right, which is where you say, OK, let's vary the number of spectra from 1.5 million to 30 million and find out how it changes. And in that process, we saw the curve go straight up and then across. And the reason is that actually the difference, it's not, the, the title of this slide is now wrong. The, the, the big difference is using higher quality data with lower false discovery rate helps a lot. That's at least that's what we believe. We're still checking into this. But remember I told you the massive KB, the data set used for Gleams, they used a very stringent 0.1% false discovery rate control. Whereas in the Deep Novo benchmark, they used a 1%, so 10 times more noise in the data. And I think that's actually the, the difference here. One last piece about Casanova before I switch to gen genomic stuff is after we published our first paper about this model in a machine learning conference, <clears throat> there was an, uh, a paper published in December in brief briefings in bioinformatics in which uh, a separate group used our model to do antibody sequencing, which is a task we hadn't yet considered, but we knew it was something people used it for. And it was pretty gratifying to see these precision, precision recall curves because they were comparing against other methods. And you can see that in every case, these are different digestion enzymes here. The Casanova model uh, dominated all the other methods. So it's independent validation and it's really doing a good job. 
Um, there's a lot more results in our preprint um, looking at immunopeptidomics and metaproteomics. So I encourage people to look at it. We're going to bigger data. We're looking at taking metadata as input. And then of course, doing transfer learning, right? Casanova and Gleams are sort of complementary tasks. Uh, it seems nice to be able to train them together. Um, and so the, both of these tools are available on GitHub. I welcome you to check them out and send us questions if you have them. And then I know lots of people are into genomics as well. So I'll, I'll spend some time on a, a, a third project. Really about maybe half of my lab um, spends time, since I'm in the Department of Genome Sciences, we spend time looking at genomics data. And this is a, a project that was done by a postdoc in my lab, Ron Zhang along with the collaborators in, at Google Research and the Brain Team, uh, Jean-Philippe Baer and Leticia Ming Papazantos. Um, <clears throat> so just by way of introduction, um, you're probably, well, I don't know, maybe you're not familiar. The um, single cell technologies can be used to measure many, or actually just sequencing in general, not just single cell, can be used to measure many different properties of the cell. So people are mostly familiar with using DNA sequencing to do that, to measure DNA, which is the genome. But you can also measure where the DNA has methylations on it. Or you can measure properties of the local three-dimensional architecture of the DNA, known as chromatin accessibility. You can measure the expression of genes from the DNA. You can also measure larger scale 3D chromatin architecture. So um, all of these things can be done at, in bulk sequencing and also in single cells. And so the motivation for this project was there's many times where you make one of these measurements of one kind and then the same sample but different sets of cells, you have a different kind of, of measurement, but we'd like to be able to compare them. And it's not very common that you have both measurements from the exact same cell. So we'd like to be able to basically infer single cell profiles in one modality based on measurements from a different modality. So here's some examples of the cross modality data sets that are available. In order to train a translation model, you have to have what's known as co-assay data, which is data where you literally do measure two or more things in the same cell, because that gives you a gold standard that you can use to, to train the model. And so these are just examples of experimental techniques that have been published over the past six or eight years or so, measuring two or more properties of the cell. And you can see they measure things like gene expression, chromatin accessibility, methylation, and so on. In our paper, we focused on this first column because this is the most common pair of things to measure. Gene expression is the rate at which the gene gets translated into or transcribed into messenger RNAs. And accessibility is, as I mentioned, it's sort of the, the openness of the chromatin, the how the DNA is uh, compacted or not compacted at particular positions along the genome. And so the goal of the project is to say, someone hands you a measurement of a cell, and they say, here's the expression levels of all 20,000 genes. I want you to tell me what is the chromatin accessibility profile look like? So that means what are, you know, across the genome, where are there regions of open chromatin and closed? And so we want a translator that goes from one to the next. And the idea is if we had that, then if we only have measurements in one modality, we could use the model to translate into the other modality and then draw inferences about how these two different mechanisms are related to each other. So the reason, um, the reason we take the approach we do is that the first slide, the, the slide two slides ago, where I described the different kinds of co-assay data, I didn't really emphasize that all of those methods are pretty complicated and expensive compared to regular single cell sequencing. And so you have orders of magnitude more data from single measurement assays than you do from these co-assays. Um, and so we... Um, we need a lot of data in order to train this, and there's not that much co-assay data. And so our hypothesis was maybe we can use a semi-supervised approach where we make use of both. We're going to use the co-assay data and the single assay data to do a better job of cross-modality translation. So here's a <clears throat> schematic of the approach. We're going to train two autoencoders. 
right? An autoencoder is just a simple self-supervised neural network that takes some data as input, uh, compacts it, compresses it down to a compact representation, and then outputs that same data on the out, uh, on the on the decoder side. So we do that both for RNA seq and for attack seq, and then we take the encoder from one couple it to the decoder from the other, and then train a translation model in the middle. And the key is that the, the step one can be done with single assay data. And then in step two, we fix the parameters in the blue and the yellow, and we only train a small number of parameters in the green based on the small amount of co-assay data. So we're not the first group to try to do cross-modality translation. There's a couple different Babel, SCMM, and MultiVI were the ones that uh, that um, we were aware of. Um, and we, in this study, we're mostly comparing against Babel. Um, the only one that has ever used the single assay data was MultiVI, but they hadn't actually um, shown that that was uh, helping them at all. Um, and so the setup that we're using is, the method, by the way, is called Polar Bear. Uh, is the phase one is the unsupervised pre-training phase where you actually have the co-assay data and the single assay data here. <clears throat> we input the co-assay data into a variational autoencoder uh, where a variational autoencoder is an autoencoder in which the um, the values at the, the, the bottleneck layer in the middle here are constrained to follow a Gaussian distribution. Uh, we actually have some modeling of batch effects and sequencing depth that are important for the model to work well. Uh, we do a similar thing for both types of data. And then in the second phase, we just take the co-assay data and we just take the bottleneck layers here and we train a cross-modality translator that goes between the two. And this is useful in two different ways. <clears throat> so one of them is the one I mentioned, which is you can take this translator and um, take existing single assay profiles and predict the missing modality. And that can help you to see cell level differences in gene expression and also group level signatures. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then it also can be helpful for aligning the single cell assays across modalities because you can say, I'm gonna take the blue, the blue ones project into the orange space and then project these into the orange space. And that way, everyone lives in the same embedded space. And you can match, you can do nearest neighbors to match cells. So the data that we use is a collection of one set of co-assay data, about 10,000 cells from uh, a co-assay called SNARE-seq. Um, and then three sets of single assay data, two for attack-seq and one for RNA-seq. Um, and you can see there's many more cells here than there are for the, the co-assay data. We actually have uh, two different train test splitting procedures. One of them is just the standard random splitting, 80% training, 20% test. The other is a harder setting where we say, we're gonna cluster these into cell types and we're gonna entirely hold out one cell type, simulating the, the setting where you've looked at a new tissue or something that has some cell type you've never seen before. So, First thing we do is just measure how well we do at uh, single cell RNA-seq translation performance. And for this task, we make the prediction of your gene expression profile. This is uh, making a prediction for thousands of genes at a time. And we use the Pearson correlation of the predicted profile versus the observed profile as the performance measure. Um, and what we compared here is uh, our method, polar bear, on the vertical axis versus Babel. So these are uh, gene-wise correlations. So each uh, dot here is a cell, and we're looking at correlations over all the genes. And what you want to be is above the line y equals x, right? You want the correlations from polar bear to be higher than the ones from Babel. And you can see that that is the case in a you know 1,067 cells compared to 138. As a control to test our main hypothesis, we also compared polar bear to a version of polar bear where we just trained using the co-assay data. So we followed all the same steps. And that also show, shows a big improvement when we actually make use of the single assay data. 
So this implies that the semi-supervised approach is better than just training a model from the co-assay data alone. Of course, we can also translate in the opposite direction. <clears throat> in the other direction, though, the predictions that you're outputting are really more like binary values. You want to know at each location along the genome whether it's open or closed. And so it's a classification task. And so in that setting, the performance measure is the area under the ROC curve. And so again, we compare it to Babel and to the, the co-assay only version of polar bear. And in each case, we report the number of cells that receive a better ROC from polar bear versus the competing model. And again, you can see a consistent improvement. <clears throat> um, we did the same kind of evaluation in the other setting where we're looking at, instead of randomly splitting the cells, we look at an unseen cell type. So this is obviously harder. Um, and uh, we have a smaller number of, of cells to train on because we can't really cross validate across everything. We just have this one held out cell type. But again, you see a good comparison both for the RNA-seq translation, which are the two plots I'm showing here, and for the attack-seq translation, which are the plots I'm showing here. And then finally, the other thing we can use polar bear for, I mentioned before, is aligning cells across modalities. So the idea is we take the single assay profiles, we project them, and visual. this is a visualization into two dimensions, but in, in reality, the, the dimensional, the embedding space is more like uh, 256 dimensions. Um, and then we do an, a nearest neighbor um, calculation in that embedded space. So ideally what you'd like, and so this in this picture, we've connected each cell's two measurements to each other. And you know, the long ones are bad, right? This is where the RNA-seq profile was, was, you know, let's say here, and the attack-seq profile was way far away. Whereas the little short ones are really good because your, your two measurements are close together. And so we can quantify this as the fraction of samples that are closer than the true match. So you want you basically say how many of the cells in the complete collection are closer to me than my actual neighbor based on the label, um, and so this is the uh, how we quantify that. We rank the cells by this fraction, and we make a, a cumulative density of, of the the phoscatum score, um, and we're again comparing polar bear, polar bear with the coassay only and the Babel model in terms of this, its ability to align the cells across modalities. Um, and this, we can do this either way. You can do it by projecting into the RNA-seq space or pro projecting into the attack-seq space. And what you can see is it works well in either case. And in fact, it also works well whether or not we do the random splitting or the unseen cell type splitting. Um, although the unseen cell type one is a harder setting. So <clears throat> polar bear, uh, seems to be su successful at this cross-modality translation task. Um, and it, it does a good job of matching cells across modalities um, and also recapitulates individual cell level differences. What we're working on now is generalizing the model to different kinds of data sets and contexts and data modalities. And in particular, what Ron's next paper will be about is um, adding features to this kind of model to, and to handle time series data sets. Um, so those are the three stories that I wanted to tell, and I'm happy to stop here and have a discussion. Great. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I would have a few questions, but uh, I would first ask the audience if there are questions. Um, so if, if you have any questions, you can raise the raise hand button should be down there, then we can give you access to talk. Or if you want, just write in the chat and we will pass Thank it on. You. So let's maybe just start with, with one of my questions. Um, so for the um, Casanovo um, approach, you as you explained, you, you integrated way more data, like really much more data, right? And I got this first idea that maybe big data really helps, which you kind of rejected then, right? Uh, because it was more about false discovery rate. Um, 
But I was wondering, uh, from your experience, um, do you see this in other projects that you realize, okay, big data really helps, especially when we deal with um, deep learning um, uh, methods and such? It's a good question. There's, I'm trying to think of other examples of my personal experience. Certainly there's lots of examples in the literature. Um, where big data it makes a big difference. I'm trying to think of concrete examples where we have run into this phenomenon. I mean, you know, I, I guess what I one of my interpretations is when you see a learning curve like the one that I described, I didn't show it because it's just literally Melly came up with it like within the last day or two. Um, but <clears throat> um, when it goes straight up and then flat, right? So what we're seeing is with 1.5 million spectra, you can do as well as with 30 million spectra. To me, that suggests that probably our model is not parameterized well in the sense that it maybe we're not making use of all that additional data, right? Um, but the, the other alternative is what I alluded to is maybe it's just that there's the data is so noisy that we're 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 reaching the peak of what can be done. Um, so what I'm hopeful, what I hope is that we can um, explore the model parameter space a little bit more so that we could try to find a model that actually does continue to learn as we get as we get more data. Uh, because you know, I, I sort of believe that there should be information in those additional 28.5 million spectra that we provided. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question more related to the to the application of the of polar bear. Um, so basically, uh, so this is for for single cell RNA seq coupled with single cell attack seq, right? So you get two profiles out of one single cell, and now there are also methods that co-profile um, transcriptomes, so it's RNA seq, and then several. Um, histone mark profiles, right? Um, yes. So you, you might get like the, the RNA seq and then together with single cell, let's say chip seq for, for different, for diff like the main, the, the famous four or three histone marks, right? So what do you think? How big is the step to, to have polar bear also working on, on such data? Um, or mostly even... it's just, a, I think mostly it's just about getting training data. And then relatively mm -hmm. straightforward, you know, coding changes to to take different input formats. But I don't think there's a big conceptual change because you know there is a conceptual difference between the classification and regression setting. But we already have those differences in the attack seek and RNA seek. And so, depending on how you want to frame the histone modification, I mean, there is a there is a design choice there. Of you know, some histone modifications are more punctate in their features. So then you might just want to say, is there a histone mod or not? And frame it like classification, or you might want to have it be regional. Um, so there's some, I, what I think of as relatively minor empirical choices to make, but mostly it's about getting good training data and then setting up the model, I think. I mean, I, I agree with you that ultimately what we would like is one model. I mean, we did a pair, right? And the, it's an interesting you. question to think about if you had five or six modalities, should you do lots of pairwise translators, or do they all go into one space? And you know, how does that how does that work? Yeah, because it's it's richer, right? You have you have basically right. different profiles. And what we know also from bulk sequencing is that there's a lot of information about one histone mark when you know two or three others, right? Um, so that could be really interesting to kind of expand this interaction between different encoders and, and decoders and having a model in between. Uh, however, um, we don't know yet if it's really necessary, right? Or if we can stick to pairwise um, uh, like modality um, analysis, right? Yeah. Right. But yeah, I mean, more data. I know, I just said that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and more data is coming at the moment, as, as far as I could see, right? Yeah. Right. For sure. More data and more different data types. Yes. Are there other There's questions? a question in the, the question and answer session. Should I read that one? There was, I mean, Nesset, do you want to ask directly? And there's 
one raised hand. Um, I can do it like that. So there's two questions. Let's see. Wait. Here we go. So, so that, yeah. Oh, go should I just read the question? Uh, thank you. Sorry, uh, my, my, my microphone controls were not available. Um, okay. It, it's about you. Thank you for this for this great talk. It's very um, comprehensive and, and inspiring. Um, regarding the second part of your talk, can you can you please clarify whether the cell single cell data or um, expression values and ATAC values or quoting values used were cell type specific or were they mixed cell types? Yes. So it's a good question. They are. Um... I guess the, the measurements themselves are cell type specific, but the model, we don't really know which cells are which cell type. That's one of the big tasks in this domain is to try to infer cell types, but we intentionally designed polar bear to be agnostic to that. So you may remember in some of the figures I showed, there were, um, you know, the, I think there was a concept figure back here. Oh yeah, here. Um, like, Conceptually, this might be three cell types, right? Mm -hmm. We have sort of three nominal clusters here, but uh, we didn't. And but polar bear doesn't use any information about that. That would that would be something that people like to try to infer from this kind of data. Yes, that 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 that, that makes great sense. I, I was I was thinking more about the training data, the training data that went into your into polar bear. I think this right. was slide spec. Uh, Stephen, if you. Oh, yeah, where was it? It's here. Uh, no, not the the one with the um, uh, the short polar bear method and application examples. I think that had the the core essay clouds. This one, this one. So the oh. the, the the blue and the and the red uh, cell cloud um, or clusters. What, what was was this a single cell type or was this a mix of single cell types in the training? It's a it's a mix. So it's a complex tissue that has many cell types in it. Wow, that's that's impressive. That's the idea is that we're but but you know as I said, the polar bear doesn't know which ones are which cell type. It's just getting the profiles. Yeah. Do, do you think it? Do you think performance would be better or different if you trained uh, with matching cell single cell type data only? Let's say uh, T cell single cell RNA seq. Uh, co essay with T cell only single cell SEA tick, and then the same. I thing think that, yeah, I think that would be definitely an easier problem. Yeah. But of course, then the model would only work in that one cell type. So you'd have to train a whole set of models, one per cell type. Um, could, could, you, could you combine the, the trained models? Well, I mean, that's how the that's essentially what Polar Bear does, <laughs> right? Uh, right. Uh, we just, I don't think it's necessary to have the cell type labels to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering because if you don't have cell type labels, there's a there's a possibility that um, the training matches the RNA expression of a T cell with the chromatin profile of a of a B cell, for example. No, no, there isn't because the training data, the coassay data, is literally measured measurements from the same cell. Oh, so I from mean, the same the cell key. type, cell lines, or something like this. It's for, literally from the same cell. All right, Not so you same. match cell identities. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way All you right. can train this kind of translation. Okay, cool. All right, co that's that's the difference between the single assay and co assay data. All right, so you 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 essentially match barcodes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thanks for clarifying this, and sorry for being slow in the uptake. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's good. I'm sure others all had similar questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I would yeah. just to maybe take that the question in the chat. Uh, you might be also able to that, to read. Nested. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask that. Thank you uh, so much for your talk. Yeah, the the getting the correct representations of uh, biological data is usually a critical step when you apply deep learning methods. So I was wondering, uh, is there any specific reason that you choose to use CNN and the given dimension uh, for the first project? For example, why you didn't uh, choose use autoencoders or different methods? Thank you. Yeah, good question. So for the first, you're talking about the Gleams project, right? Uh, yes, yes, that's yeah. right. Well, so um, you could use autoencoders, and we did consider that. 
I mean, I guess one of the challenges there is that um, <clears throat> it's not totally obvious. Um, you you still have to have <clears throat> some kind of um, loss function to do the supervision. So the autoencoder is just a, a self-supervised method. So you would have to link the autoencoder with some kind of model like the one I described, right? Because otherwise there's no way to put the labels in. Um, but it is an interesting hypothesis that with additional, you could imagine having pre-training, for example, um, or multitask training where you do the, the supervised training that I described along with some other kind of autoencoder, for example, and maybe that would help um, make it work even better. That's not something that we investigated. Um, we also didn't spend a lot of time looking at different model architectures in terms of uh, whether to use a convolutional neural network or other types of you know, recurrent neural networks or so on. Um, partly because the performance was quite good with what we had. I mean, we did experiment with, I mean, one of the key parameters is what is the dimensionality of the, the embedded space, right? I mentioned we used 32. That one we did experiment with, and there's a trade-off there, which is mostly related to downstream use. That is, you know, we wanted to be able to cluster 800 million spectra, and doing that, you know, with reasonable amounts of memory is a lot harder if you have a 256 dimensional vector versus say a 32 dimensional one. So we did observe that you could get slightly better performance on some of our evaluation measures if we used say 64 dimensions or 128 dimensions instead of 32, but it was a small difference and we wanted to be able to fit more into memory. Um, so we, we, we stayed with the more compact representation, but depending on your use case that might you might make a different choice. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. It's um, it's actually um, twelve o'clock. Um, oh, it's already. That went fast. Klaus, maybe maybe one quick yep. last quick question, maybe. Okay. Uh, hi, I was just wondering yeah. about the mass spec data sets you mentioned. Even that there's so many different mass spec platforms out there. Um, what's the data set uh, collecting only from single specific most abundant uh, platforms? And how would these different platforms influence your results? From the no, it's a great data, question. It it's a great question. Yeah, this is all mostly data, I think entirely data from thermo instruments. Um, and so, and they're all, you know, Orbitrap or, you know, I, I guess some of the, some of the more common uh, thermo instruments. So uh, it is true that there's other instrument platforms out there that give data that's similar, but systematically different. You know, it's, uh, it's not exactly the same. So on the one hand, we would expect that our method won't generalize well to spectra from those instruments. But on the other, it does seem like it should be straightforward to, to train a model, either based on that other kind of data, or maybe on both types of data simultaneously. We were mostly the actually the effort put in to you know generate a set of very high confident detections across you know they ran it on uh, 680 million spectra. That's a whole project in itself, and so we were sort of leveraging what Nuno Banderas group had already done, um, and we or somebody should also do this for other instrument platforms because I think it's a it's very helpful for the field to have these big sets of data out there. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're right that if you have enough data, you could uh, definitely learn. The methodology is independent on the platform. The only thing is in how how you could mix them. If you know that you have a like low abundance from some platforms, maybe you might not be able to then generalize. Right. right. So one of the things that were that I think would be important is to put in some kind of metadata to represent you know, what instrument generated this spectrum, because then then the, the system could learn to uh, represent that as well. And I think that would be critical for making it perform well. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Maybe Thank you very much. Klaus, I mean, anyway, if someone has to leave, we can <laughs> just leave, um, but we can just ask the final question and then, I guess. Final question you would suggest, yeah. <laughs> so, Klaus, then.
Yes, so I, I'm. 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 Th thanks again for your great talk. I'm. I'm a biologist by background and by by trade, and and yeah. I'm, I have to admit I'm. I'm tremendously impressed by the ever more accurate predictions uh, of the various um, machine learning approaches that are now leveraged in biology. Um, but I'm also quite um, how do I put this bored in the best meaning of the word about yeah. about only ever more in, ever more precise uh, predictions. Um, and I wonder whether the models um, that we are building can teach us something about biology that we actually do, currently don't know in biology. So to make a very simple and no, contrived example, um, RNA uh, abundance in a single cell is, is a consequence of multiple different me biological mechanisms, uh, transcription and so on, um, and, 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 and gene expression, and, and obviously, um, DNA chromatin accessibility. So if you can predict um, single cell, uh, the, the abundance of a single, uh, of an RNA in a single cell from, 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 transcript, from, from uh, ATEC data only, the, the model must have learned more than a, just a simple correlation between the two data types. Because the, the correlation models in the past of the 90s and 90s, they had, they had, they had essentially a very disappointing performance. So in inside the model, in somewhere in the in the weights of the of the vertices and the and the nodes, then the model must have learned something about biology. That yes, most but we don't know. Can can we can we open lift that hood and find it out? Well, so maybe, but I think it's actually uh, worth thinking about. There are many ways to use these models to get insights into biology that don't involve opening the model up. You know, for example. In the example you gave, it may be that the relationship between mRNA expression and chromatin accessibility differs by cell type, right? And some cells have one relationship and some cells, some cell types have a different relationship. And if we use cell type inference, um, and then we used a method like polar bear to say, okay, now we've got for each cell type paired measurements of gene expression and chromatin accessibility, we can ask how does that relationship vary as a function of cell type uh, across the genome? That you could figure out, you know, how different what the what the cell type level differences are um, from single cell from two different single cell single assay measurements that are put together with a model like polar bear, or you know, for example, with the um, uh, the Casanova project. I found, you know, for instance, the antibody sequencing, that's not really learning new biology, but people are using the model to solve real problems. We actually got contacted by someone in the UK who was using this for Casanova for mass spectrometry on ancient uh, skeletons, you know, doing mass spec sequencing of, of, um, of ancient proteins. Uh, there's all kinds of different applications where um, you know, we have collaborators using it for ocean metaproteomics, for example. You can understand better about the microbes in ocean currents uh, because we can start to sequence them in a way that we couldn't. So, I mean, I think the models themselves, the predictions themselves are useful and can tell us interesting biology. Um, and then there are some, uh, there's lots of work on trying to make the innards of the models more interpretable. Um, some of those stories are easier to make when you have models that are related to, for example, DNA sequence, because then you can start asking, what are the sequence patterns that give rise to, say, this behavior? It's less obvious to me how you, even what questions you would ask of a model of polar bear. You know, inside, yes, it has some way to translate from gene expression to, to attack seek, but I don't even know what query to ask the model to have it tell us you know, what patterns it's picked up that relates them. Uh, it's an interesting question to think about, I think. Well, no, for, for, for example, a, a matrix of, of the open, open chromatin elements required for a, to, to achieve a certain level of expression of, single RNA, of, of, of a single RNA species. Oh, and I see. Uh, yeah, so that is, so we do have work on using these models in a predictive setting where you can say, if we have a model that can predict something, now let's design an input that achieves a particular desired output. Yeah. Uh, that would be fantastic for biology. And, and, and Bill, sorry, I didn't mean at all to, to say 
uh, that uh, that application of, of machine learning and biology is, is of no use. It's 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 no, no, I understand. It's actually, yeah. it's you know, it's it's tremendously changing biology. Um, but I'm 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 very interested in learning more about the mechanism of biology. Uh huh. Because you know, we've done only so well over the past two hundred years, and and I, and I have a sense that machine learning can do much better than what we did in two hundred years, uh, in, in in maybe ten, <laughs> if we can only lift the hood. It does seem like it. That's right. Yes. Okay. Th th thank you for for answering all of this. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the very interesting discussion. And um, with this, I would say. Have a nice afternoon uh, in Seattle, and to all of the attendees, um, have a nice, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.